and welcome again to Skeptical 2022. My name is Carolyn Doherty, and I'm a member of the Sacramento Area Skeptics. I'm so happy to introduce our next speaker, Kenny Biddle. Kenny Biddle is a science enthusiast who investigates claims of paranormal experiences, equipment, photos, and video. His investigations are featured in Skeptical Inquirer, both in his online column, A Closer Look, and his video series, Ghost in the Machine. Kenny hosts the live stream show, The Skeptical Help Bar, where he blends skepticism and science with the atmosphere of a local bar. A promoter of science, critical thinking, and skepticism, he frequently hosts workshops on how to deconstruct and explain paranormal photography and video, as well as how to investigate and solve mysteries. In 2020, Kenny was elected a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Please welcome my friend, Kenny Biddle. Hey there, skeptics and believers and everyone in between. Welcome to my talk, my presentation for the Skeptical 2022. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is the first time I'm here speaking to you guys like this, so I'm excited. I was invited to talk about my journey, my I guess my backstory of how I went from a ghost hunter to a skeptical investigator and, and all the work that I do now. So I, I hope this is entertaining to you. I hope you can relate to some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And that, you know, maybe you, you gain some insight into how people can change, even though they come from a very, very uh, strong background in believing in stuff. So let me just get right to it. So I grew up in a Catholic household. My mother is a very devout Catholic, and my father is not a devout Catholic. <laughs> he really didn't go with any religion except for the mantra of do what your mother tells you. So that means I was raised Catholic. And that basically means that I believed in God. I believed in one God, the Christian God. And that I believed in a place called hell, that I believed in a place called heaven, uh, where all the good people went. Hell was the where all the bad people went. And then there was, there was this like uh, place in between called purgatory that was kind of like a waiting room for a doctor's office because it felt like your soul was there forever. Um, that's what I was told. I never really understood that, but that's what I'm going with. Uh, but also, I believed in angels. Angels were real. Like That was real to me. I was taught that angels were real, and you could uh, get help from angels. You had guiding angels or, or angels that would help you all the time. I was, I was also taught that demons were real. Uh, the devil was real because that is who made you do bad stuff or tempted you to do bad things. So I was also taught about this guy named Jesus who was the son of God and had all these magic powers. I mean, literally had magic powers. He could turn water into wine. He could, he could walk on water. He healed the sick. He did all this weird stuff. He even came back from the dead. I mean, and that, and that to me, that, that's usually a zombie. Uh, I, so... From a young age, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. From a young age, from birth, literally, I was conditioned to believe in supernatural beings. From gods to magic powers, coming back from the dead, an afterlife, a, uh, a world that is on top or below this world where other beings existed. So it was a natural progress progression from, from believing in all that stuff to ghost hunting. Uh, be, becoming a ghost hunter because I just naturally went in and said, "Yeah, ghosts are real. Uh, they they have to be real. They're they're supernatural beings. They they just haven't moved on yet." Um, I remember being in school in grade school, a Catholic grade school, uh, in the library, and there were two books that had to do with the paranormal, and they were the same two books that I read for several years, because that's the only books I was interested in uh, while going to Catholic school. And they were about ghosts, and they had the Brown Lady of Raymond Hall, and uh, the Tulip Staircase ghost, and the the ghost guy that's in the back of an old uh, of car. He, he like sits in the back seat. I forget what that's actually called, but it's a pretty famous uh, ghost photo. So I guess what I'm saying, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. I believed in this stuff from the beginning. I was conditioned to believe, and it opened me up to everything else. So ghosts were a natural next step. Uh, and then everything else, believing in aliens and monsters. I mean, hell, 
that's it. Like, did I believe in aliens? Yes. Did I think they were doing uh, uh, prostate exams? Yes, <laughs> because that's that's what the stories were. Um, I believed in Loch Ness Monster. I believed in Bigfoot, you know, that there was a big hairy ape roaming around the woods somewhere. And I was scared. I was literally scared. I lived in Philadelphia and I was scared that I was going to go into the woods as a young guy, a young kid and run into Bigfoot. I mean, that's it's kind of silly, but these were the things I grew up with. And then further along in my life, I, I grew up a little bit. I got into my 20s, uh, my early 20s, and I got engaged and married. I got married to my wonderful wife, uh, who I've been married to for 25 years now. And that's an achievement on its own because I am a difficult person to live with. So props to her. But uh, when, when we got married, the first thing we did was buy a computer because there was this new thing coming out or it was already out called the internet or the World Wide web and it was amazing you know it was amazing we could connect with everybody we could look up things on our computer like wow that was mind-boggling it was like supernatural to us so the first thing I did was look up ghost hunting groups and there were there were a lot in my area and I was like wow this is great I can actually go out and join a group and look for these fascinating things that I've only read about in books or, or heard about on like TV shows like In Search Of. I mean, In Search Of, who didn't grow up with that? Um, probably the younger generation. But I loved it. It was a, a staple every night when it was on. I was there watching it. Leonard Nimoy taught me everything I needed to know about the supernatural. Unfortunately, it was, a lot of it was bullshit, but <laughs> I didn't learn that until later. So when I was searching for these ghost hunting teams and I found one in my local area and I joined it and I was amazed because they had they had equipment. They had gadgets that they claimed detected ghosts. And to be honest, I didn't know anything about them. I had no knowledge how these devices worked. Yet they would blink. The little lights would turn on for no reason, for no reason, and they would sound alarms and I had no idea except that what I was told was a ghost did it. And because of my background, because of my, my upbringing, I believed it. I accepted this stuff at face value and just went with it. And I started becoming a quote-unquote expert in made-up shit. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the best way to say it because I started taking all these stories, all this information that I was learning from other ghost hunters and incorporating it into my worldview and saying, well, now I know all this. And I'm going to regurgitate it back to other people when they ask me questions. I mean, we're talking, they had pictures of, of apparitions and what was called orbs and ecto, uh, ecto mist, which was like a misty thing that they all said was ghosts. And I was, I was becoming a ghost hunter at the time where film cameras were still popular and the most used cameras, but digital cameras were starting to come out. So you had the Sony Mavica coming out and people were paying eight nine hundred dollars for this camera so you could get 10 pictures on a little uh, uh diskette um that would slide inside but they also had audio recordings where you know they claimed nobody was in the room and they would ask a question and they would get an answer and it was a different voice that gave the the answer and it was very very convincing to someone that was ignorant to the sciences ignorant ignorant to well, I guess, to be honest, common sense, it was amazing to me. It was very convincing to me. And I just, I ate it up. I, I took, I went to conferences. They were ghost hunting conferences. They still have them today. And I soaked up all the stories. I, I saw people standing up in front of the crowd that had been on TV. They were giving lectures, um, you know, lectures. And now, now it's weird because I see those lectures as not lectures. They're more storytelling uh, to me than actual lectures. But that's a whole different topic to get into. But I was, I was looking at these people and these were people, I guess that I, I had idolized. And so I soaked it up. I soaked up all their stories, all the information they were giving me, all the, the things that I would ask questions. If I asked questions, they would give me an answer, whether it was true or not. I didn't look it up. I never bothered to look it up. And that's a common thread. That's a common theme with ghost hunting community, UFO hunters, uh, Bigfoot hunters, everyone that looks for these supernatural or fringe topics or looks into them, so many just don't bother to check the information. 
And that was my downfall. That was, that was my problem, too. I even went as far as to write a ghost hunting guide, which you'll see on the screen here. Uh, I did that because it's all the stuff that I have been soaking up, all the information I've been soaking up. I bought hundreds, if not thousands of dollars worth of ghost hunting equipment because I thought it was detecting ghosts. I thought it was uh, capturing ghosts. And later on, I learned that it wasn't. But at the time, that's what I was going with. And then it really hit me. Uh, I really got the bug to be one of those people that were up on the stage talking to the audience. I thought that was great. I wanted to be a paranormal expert. I wanted to be a ghost hunting expert. So I started doing my own lectures. I started trying to get in on conferences and, and get on the, the speakers uh, list so I could talk about my experiences. And, uh, and again, with the book that I put out, I, I thought I was an expert, but I was pretty much the embodiment of the Dunning-Kruger effect where I knew very little, but I thought I knew it all. I really did. And this is the common theme with, with paranormal enthusiasts. And because I'm going to use it across the board, not just ghost hunters, but everyone that, that goes after uh, or looks for fringe topics, uh, creatures and, and entities like that. It's a common theme for all of us to think that we know so much more than we really do. And it's a, it's a big downfall. It's a mistake. And I kept pushing. I kept pushing and adopting uh, titles that I did not earn. I would start telling people that, yes, I am doing scientific investigations. And I had no freaking clue what the scientific method was. I had never heard of it prior to, uh, well, years later. Uh, I just, I was like, yeah, I know, I know, I'm scientific. I, I'm totally doing science. I have gadgets. That means I'm scientific. That was the mentality that I had. And I shared it with thousands of other ghost hunters. I had no clue what I was doing, honestly. I, I had no clue. I had no clue how to do an experiment or to how to properly design an experiment, how to uh, get controls and protocols in place in order to make sure it was a valid experiment. I didn't know how to analyze photography uh, or videos. I didn't know any of that. But I fell into a trap where I was making it up. I was literally making things up. If I didn't know the answer, I created one. I used my imagination, created an answer that I thought fit all the so-called facts, and that's what I taught. I didn't bother to check myself. I didn't bother to cite references or uh, consult experts, anything like that. I thought I was the expert, and I th that really caused a, a, a lot of problems for me later on. Um, I regret doing that because it's just I put so much bad information out there, and when I look back now, it's embarrassing me. It's embarrassing. Uh, like I listen to what I'm talking about now and I'm reviewing this video as I'm making it. And it's really embarrassing. The things that I talked about, I, that I told people, that I told homeowners uh, that their house was haunted and, and that they had demons or evil entities. I really feel bad for what I did. And I'm trying really hard to make it up. So getting a little off topic here, let me get back on track ghost hunting so i was full into it i'm doing everything i was ghost hunting everywhere private homes businesses historic sites i was going out to battlefields uh like gettysburg because that's not too far from me i i've been out there many times and i was doing conferences i was speaking at conferences i was writing a book I, I i was trying to write a book on ghost stories i wrote one on the guidebook which i mentioned earlier like how to ghost hunt which is comical when you read it now but I was doing all this stuff, and I was fully invested, fully invested with equipment and time and quote-unquote reputation, all of that. And then it changed. And then it changed not overnight, but kind of overnight. So let me tell you this story. I went out to Gettysburg. Uh, Pennsylvania we were uh, I was with my ghost hunting group and we're sitting in the woods and this particular part of woods it was it was right next to the wheat field it still is right next to the wheat field uh, across from a monument to the Irish Brigade and it was a little section we had talked to a 
ranger, a park ranger, earlier that day. And from what I remember, and I don't know if it's true today or if it was true back then, but we had this idea that park rangers were not allowed to talk about any kind of ghost sightings or paranormal stuff, that it was just against it. It was against uh, policy. I don't know if that's true or not, but we had spoken to a guy that was a park ranger, and we talked to him off hours, and he said that there was this particular place in, in the woods and that there was a high amount of activity and that none of the other park rangers would go there. They hated going there if they had to, but everyone tried to avoid it at all costs because it was just so much ghostly, paranormal activity there that they, it freaked everyone out. So naturally, I was like, yeah, that's great. You know, nobody else knows about this? And they said, no. And that, if you don't know, this is a ghost hunter's dream to be the first at a place and to have a secret spot that you can, well, for lack of a better word, exploit all to yourself. You know, you can exploit it because nobody else knows where it is. They can't get to it. They can't um, refute your claims or, or your photographs or your videos that you get from there. They can't do anything because nobody knows where it is. And it's like, ah, oh, it's mine. It's mine. So we're there one night. And it was during a conference. It was during a conference weekend. And I think it was, uh, oh, I forget the name of it. It was like Gettysburg. I think it was just a simple name of Gettysburg Ghost Conference. And we were staying in town. So we're, we're in this field. And there's maybe like six of us or so. And we're sitting there in the dark waiting, waiting for something to happen. And we're doing these uh, what's called EVP sessions where you ask questions to the to the area or to the dark and you have recorders on and you're hoping that a ghostly voice will magically show up on your recording and that you can you know be excited later and you're like oh they answered my question so we're, we're doing all this we're taking some pictures here and there and I look out across the field across the wheat field now we're in the woods so and it's dark so nobody sees us nobody can see us and I'm looking out past the tree line into the open field that is the wheat field and I see three cars coming down. And about midway, uh, midway uh, down the street, there's a, a little pull-off so that cars can park and people can get out and, and walk around. And that's what these cars did. There's three cars, a bunch of people get out. We see flashlights turn on. We hear people laughing, goofing off. And they get, to get into a group and they start walking around. And I didn't think really anything of it until maybe a minute later and I noticed that they were walking towards us like in our direction across the field and I started getting worried and I was like oh no they're gonna they're gonna find us if they find us our secret spot will be ruined they're gonna know we're here and they're gonna ask questions like oh why you're here and oh you're ghost hunters too you know if they were ghost hunters I can see them saying well you know can we hang out for a little bit and then we'd either have to you know be nice and say yes or be mean and say go away um, which I probably would have been mean <laughs> and said, go away, because this is my super secret spot. You can't have it. Anyway, they get closer. They get closer and closer, and I'm, they're getting louder, and I'm getting angry. I'm getting very mad because I'm, I'm on the verge of losing this secret spot. And I, was, I had been so excited about it. I was looking forward to this. So I, I lost my temper, and I walked out of the woods just out of the woods so it wasn't like I ran up to them I walked out of the woods and I started yelling about go away I don't know I don't remember exactly what I said it's been many many years but I basically told them to go the f away get out leave us alone you don't need to be here go find your own spot and everything stopped they all stopped everyone stopped dead and <laughs> pardon the pun um and they ran like they just turned around and started running and they all went back to their cars, got in the cars and sped away. And that was it. I said, all right, cool. I went back in the woods and I calmed down a little bit and enjoyed the rest of the night. Uh, nothing happened. Not, absolutely nothing happened. No ghosts or anything like that. But that's it. Next morning, I come down and my, my wife gets up. We, we go down to the conference uh, area, the, the conference room, and we start hearing people tell stories and they're telling stories about, you know, what they were doing last night and uh, what they what they found in the battlefields and this and that. And there's an excited group telling a story about how they 
saw an apparition last night. Now, I'm sure some of you are going to know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. So we walked over, we're, we're talking to them, because we knew some of the people, and we're chatting, and they're like, yeah, we saw this apparition. The whole group saw it, and there was a bunch of them. I mean, we're talking at like maybe 12 people or so that saw this apparition, and they're all excited. They're all freaking freaking out and just really excited about it, and we asked to tell, tell the story again. And they said that it was in the wheat field. And I'm thinking like, well, we were there all night. There was no apparition. I didn't see anything. I didn't see any ghosts floating around. And they said they were all showed up and they started walking towards the woods. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know, that that's where I was. I wonder if, you know, I, I'm still not connecting the dots yet. I'm, I'm wondering like where, where in the woods did they see it? You know, I don't remember seeing anybody else except the people I yelled at. And that's when it really hit me because they're like, we walked close to the woods and a, a soldier, a soldier came out of the woods and materialized out of the woods and started yelling at them in this booming voice to go away, get out. This is my land. You know, you get all this kind of stuff that was more related to the, the Gettysburg battle than anything else and that it freaked them out and they all ran. And that's when, you know, everything clicked in my head, like, holy crap, that was me. That was, that was me. I was, I was the ghost. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't dressed like a soldier. I was dressed in just jeans and a shirt, but I probably had a jacket on, so I might have looked like that. I didn't materialize, but then I thought, well, I did come out of the dark woods, you know, and it was a moon... The, the moon was out that night, so there was some light on the field, and from a dark area of the woods, yeah, it probably looked like I just appeared out of nowhere. And this is going crazy in my head, like, holy shit, how, how did these people, these, these ghost hunters that were colleagues of mine, friends of mine, that I, I, I did the same exact thing they did, how did they mistake me, a living person, for a ghost? And that really started the, uh, the, the hamster running in the wheel um, in my head. It really got things going. And I started thinking like, wow, you know, if they were wrong about this, how many other people are wrong about their sightings? How many other people are wrong about their experiences? How many, how many times have I been wrong about what I thought I saw? And that really started me on the path to skepticism. Um, and and the, where I am now, so this this experience really hit me hard. Um, as a ghost hunter, as a believer, it really hit me hard because it just blew my mind that I was now a ghost, and I was literally part of ghost stories because it was it was being told. We came back a few months later and took one of the ghost tours in Gettysburg, and they told that story. They told the story of this group going in and seeing this ghost, which was me. And it freaked me out. Um, and it really made me stop and think about everything. Um, everything that I believed in. And, I mean, I had already grown away from uh, Catholicism. Because I, I, I had left religion a while ago. Because I just didn't believe in it anymore. I didn't believe in the gods and the angels and stuff like that. And ghosts, ghosts were my kind of go-to thing. That was my current belief at the time. And now this experience shattered it. And, and it was a good thing. I mean, it, it, it's when you have that, that hardcore belief that you've invested so much time and money and energy into and, and dedicated a lot of time to going to events and building relationships with people. And then all of a sudden you realize, crap, there, there's something wrong here. Uh, it may, really made me rethink everything that I thought uh, or believed. So... That's what I did. I really dove into some of the aspects of ghost hunting, particularly photography, because th that's one of the points that really came up and that I had been thinking about is that ghost photographs used to be rare. They used to be incredibly rare. You know, you'd have these, um, like in search of, hardly ever did a ghost show because there weren't a lot of pictures. There weren't a lot of things to show. Um, you could do ghost stories, but there wasn't a lot of quote-unquote evidence to show. 
and even in the books, the older books from the the 50s, 60s, 70s that you read, there wasn't a lot to show you. You could talk a lot, you could you could write a lot, but you couldn't show pictures. And uh, so I really started getting into it because uh, th- we're talking about the late 90s, early 2000s here, and digital cameras had come onto the scene. A lot of people were using them. There were a lot more pictures. There were a lot more ghost pictures. So you had your common things like orbs and ecto mist, which is a, a far cry from the ectoplasm from the Victorian age. Uh, you had apparitions. Now you have shadow people. You had all these different kinds of, of photographic evidence that were showing up, and I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand what was going on, so I started reading up on photography. I started learning, teaching myself about photography, and the more I learned about it, the more I understood, uh, first, how much I didn't know, and then, then I understood that a lot of these anomalies were mistakes they were camera mistakes operator error they were functions of the the camera itself it was how light was interacting with either the film and or the sensor uh, via the lenses it was there was so much and this really sparked my my enthusiasm to learn to learn more i was horrible student in high school and grade school i was horrible i didn't pay attention to anything i was a class clown i goofed off more i just wanted to get through today so i could go home and watch my cartoons um <laughs> and and go out and play so i was horrible this this experience helped spark my desire to learn and to keep learning and to build upon that uh, someone actually helped me out here, and I'm going to give him props because he's a big part of my life um, and, and, and this kind of life and what I do now. So I had started researching photography, and I actually wrote a little book, a self-published book. This isn't a free plug because it's not available anymore. I literally printed everything out and made it into a little booklet and would sell it at conferences. But it was called Orbs or Dust, and I'll put a, a, a picture up here. But it was about photography anomalies and how they were created. How orbs were usually dust particles or bugs, uh, circles of confusion. How ecto mist was usually frosty breath from people going out in, in cooler weather and catching their own breath. How apparitions were the result of long exposures. I mean, there was so much information that I was getting and I was excited about it now. And uh, once I put that little book out, a friend of mine had sent it to Benjamin Radford, who is the editor of Skeptical Inquirer magazine and a, a senior research fellow uh, with the, the Center for Inquiry. He he got the book and he contacted me and he said he liked it. He couldn't write a review about it because it wasn't actually like a, a, an official book. It wasn't uh, from a publisher because I had just, you know, put it together myself. But he loved it. And every time I asked him for questions, asked him questions about how he investigates and and what he thought of something he always answered my questions he always picked up the phone he always answered my emails which was great that nobody had done that before i mean being a ghost hunter skeptics were evil they were they were evil people they were bad they were just like scientists because they didn't want anything like in my mind they didn't want any anything to do with the paranormal they thought we were all crazy and they didn't know what i knew that's the mentality of a ghost hunter, uh, often, oftentimes. Not everybody, but often. Um, so Ben really took the time to, he, he slowed down, he answered my questions, he was patient, he, he got me into the skeptical lit- literature. So I learned about Skeptical Inquirer from him and started reading that. I learned about Joe Nickel and his work, and, and I, I mean, I love Joe Nickel's work. Uh, from that, I learned about Sharon Hill and other other people that were giving you the science and the practical reasons behind a lot of these mysteries and I was it just blew my mind and I could not stop learning and now that that's pretty much my mantra is never stop learning and I live by that that's my philosophy I don't stop learning I'm constantly looking at things I'm constantly looking up uh, how how something works um, now I do uh, a lot of work with Equipment, ghost hunting equipment. I take it apart. I see what's inside. I, I see what the components are. I figure out what the components are designed for and what they're originally used for. And then I talk about it. So Ben Rafford was a big influence on 
my shift to skepticism, and I'm very grateful to uh, to him for that. So that pretty much sums up my journey from ghost hunter to skeptical investigator. Uh, it really my, my journey started out as believer, and then uh, a really major experience shifted my mentality, and and I w the thirst for learning has never left me. Now, I continue to learn every day, and I, I love it, I enjoy it, it's my passion, and that I, I get the chance now to spread that information, and in a good way. I know how to reference my work now. I understand the importance of citations, and backing up what you say, backing up your claims, and investigating claims, and how to do simple experiments and even more complicated experiments and then I also understand how to take things apart I mean I have a background in uh, mechanical um, auto mechanic and I also build helicopters for a living so my whole background is building stuff taking things apart understanding how they work putting them back together and making sure that they work again and there's no extra parts so over the last 15 to 20 years I, I've grown a lot I think I because I understand how much I don't know and that drives my thirst to learn more and uh, it, it's been paying off I no longer go in and do a ghost hunt that you see on the typical ghost hunting shows I actually look for testable claims and I solve mysteries now I can actually solve a mystery with all the evidence to back it up all the data to back it up and and come to a good conclusion a solid conclusion which is great i i love being able to do that it has turned that that ghost hunting excitement of the unknown and everything's a ghost um it's turned it into more of a scooby-doo uh, episode where i mean i grew up with scooby-doo i loved it and now i i have that philosophy i want to solve the mystery i want to unmask old man withers and and show that it's not a ghost it's just an an old guy in a, in a costume and this is has it's paid off over the years because now i do a column i write a column for skeptical inquirer magazine that details some of my investigations whether it's photographs uh videos um the latest ghost story that goes viral on social media or ghost hunting gadgets that I take apart. Um, I've delved into UFOs and Bigfoot and other cryptids. And in addition to the column, I also do a video series for Skeptical Inquirer. And that gets even more detail. I've had the opportunity to speak at, at science groups, uh, humanist groups, skeptic groups. Um, I've presented at SciCon. I've done workshops for them uh, for a few years. And it's thrilling because now I'm not... I'm not just making shit up. I, I'm providing information that has solid backing and I can reference and that people can come, walk away from uh, my work, either reading an article, watching a video, or, or attending a lecture, and they, they can benefit from it. They can do a better job and improve the quality of their work, whether they're a ghost hunter or not. They can improve the quality of their work as they go away. And that, that brings me a lot of joy. So, in addition to the amazing opportunities that I've had over the years to speak at science conferences and skeptical conferences and, and do events for, for that community, I still go back to the ghost hunting community I, I, and UFOs and cryptids and all that. I attend their conferences. I don't just attend science conferences and skeptical events. I go to these ghost hunting conferences um, and, and events where I can interact with everyone that's still... Uh, actively pursuing it or actively involved <clears throat> and I get to see the equipment that they're using and the ideas that they're putting forth and I for the most part I am not like the the evil token skeptic that just shows up I am I, I have good relationships with most of the organizers and groups that I deal with and I try to help them as much as possible and I think that's a good good thing I think more of us need to do that where we just don't ignore them and shun them and just say, you know what, I don't, I don't care what you're doing. I, I saw five minutes in an episode and I know what's going on. I think that's a bad attitude. I, I think we need to engage. I think we need to interact with them. So I constantly try to encourage uh, skeptical people to visit paranormal conferences. 
um, what whatever genre you want, whatever fringe topic you want to get into. But visit the conferences, talk to the people involved, and see what they're thinking, how they're thinking, why they're thinking, and and have, I also encourage ghost hunters to go or or other paranormal enthusiasts to go to science conferences or come out to a skeptical event with me and see how the other side and this is advice for both sides see how the other side lives or thinks or works or operates and just figure it out um because i think you'll be better for it so uh, with that i'm gonna end this video that this lecture video i hope you enjoyed it i hope you could relate to some of the things that i was saying and maybe my journey um and maybe learn a thing or two and uh I guess uh, once this video clicks out, there'll be a live version of me so that I can answer questions. So thanks for coming. See ya. Mm. That's a good beat. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, you know, I find it really interesting. Um, one of my first takeaways is how honored I am to be friends with the very famous Wheatfield ghost. <laughs> I mean, Such I an know, embarrassing story. You know, though, it's funny because I know on at least one of our trips to Gettysburg, I know we heard that story of that mean soldier coming out yelling um yeah. it's so funny that it's still out there um you know so hopefully this will clear up for some people um hopefully and i know you hopefully and i know you and i've talked about this before um how we have the same very similar backgrounds we were both raised uh, catholic um, and in fact, you know, in my family, there, there were even ghost stories. Like my grandma had a ghost story of how she believed she saw her father's apparition after he passed away. Um, like you, I was into all these true ghost story books. Um, I still have my grandparents, uh, Reader's Digest, Strange Stories and Amazing Facts, <laughs> 1974 edition. So, um, and like, I, I mean, I it was in a book so it had to be yeah. true right yep and then like you i loved it, um in search of and unsolved mm -hmm. mysteries and again took that as gospel i mean i you know it's on tv must be true and again i i went into i got the blinky equipment and went here and there you know because <laughs> if it flashes it must be yeah you know yep. <clears throat> Um, so it's just so funny how we went into this and coming from an echo chamber of knowledge and thought we, yeah. we knew what we were doing, but we didn't, yeah. um, you know, uh, but I think it's actually good that people like you talk to others. And so like we had the believer panel earlier, so we can see that people can change. We can mm -hmm. evolve. We can learn new information and, and move on. Um, I had a similar aha moment as a ghost hunter when I went to a, a ghost hunting investigation with um, a well-known group in the region who had been profiled on ghost hunters and ghost adventures and stuff. So I went thinking, oh, I'm really going to learn from these, these people. These must be the experts. And as, as little as I had in a science background in college, I, you know, I was an English major and a music major. So what did I know? But I knew enough to know that they were full of it. And that was my aha moment. It's like, okay, wait a minute. If these experts are wrong about all this stuff in, just in one night, what else is, is out there that's so right. wrong? And it really made me start questioning, uh oh, you know, all this stuff I've been saying is not right and so like you i started diving into asking questions from people outside of the ghost hunting community um, actual photographers and um physicists whatever and it actually led me to finding this book oh my um, goodness look at that relic <laughs> um so actually I, I found that book and it you know it led me to other groups um, more skeptic-minded groups and from there on you know i 
that was my transition, like yours, and it became a skeptic. Um, awesome. My biggest takeaway from your talk, though, and I think this is so important, is how you continue to go to ghost hunting conventions. And you do talk to, pardon the pun, the other side, um, you do talk to people with opposing views, but you do it in a respectful way. And like you, you've said before, you might not change minds over my, overnight or some not at all, but you are changing mind. I mean, you and I are proof that that's happening. And so mm -hmm. I give you, you know, I many props for doing that because we, as skeptics, we need to do that. Like you just said, um, no matter what your expertise, paranormal, uh, you know, climate change, vaccines, whatever, we need to get out there and uh, make some progress by talking to the other side. Um, so I am going to shut my yapper um, <laughs> and see if we got any questions coming in. So this comes from Jay. Have you converted any true believers, ghost hunters slash ghost hunters to the ways of science and skepticism? <laughs> Ah uh, yes, Follow. this is the way. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I I have. There's been a lot of success stories over the years where uh, the approach. Because in the beginning, I was really angry. There was a phase where I was angry because I I had done so much wrong, and I was mad at myself, and I unfortunately took it out on other people. So I spent a lot of time on social media looking for a fight, and that's also embarrassing. Until I realized this isn't the way to do it. And I took a better approach to it where um, it really led to, and you described it really good with the, the skeptical help bar show that I do. It's, it's science and skepticism. It's talking about it in a local bar environment. And I love that. I love having that just casual conversation. And that's what I started doing. And over the years, it has helped because I'm not being confrontational. I'm not trying to start a fight. I'm not saying things that are, I mean, I am sarcastic. I have a very dry, sarcastic kind of attitude sometimes, but I, I am genuinely curious when someone mm -hmm. makes a claim. So I ask them about it. Tell me about this. How do you know that? You know, can help me understand what you're trying to say here. And we have a conversation about it. And then I start offering little ideas here and there and maybe offering some information and then maybe an exercise saying, well, you know, let's put paranormal like aliens or ghosts aside and what else do you think might cause that experience let's do a thought exercise and it forces them to actually start thinking outside the box and mm -hmm. from that experience yes i've had people just start thinking more and more and, and come to me and say you know what you know you you were right i looked it up i realized it wasn't true or the ghost gadgets that i have um weren't working the way they they claimed and I'm done with it. And I've had people just walk away. Uh, but they're better for it. It's not like they're disappointed. They're they're happy because now they're not being duped. And I mean, you, right. we know how much some of this equipment costs. So yes. they're saving a lot of money. Yeah. So there you go. And I feel like we redirected our curiosity. You know, we yes. never lost our, our, our curiosity about the paranormal. We just redirected it. Um, exactly. It's the Scooby-Doo effect. Because now yeah. we actually solve mysteries rather than promote them. Exactly. From our Bay Area skeptics, um, did you tell the those people at the ghost conferences the day after the incident at the Whitfield that you were the cranky ghostly soldier? <laughs> and did they believe you? <laughs> so, yes, I did. Because I said it out loud. Like, wait, that was me. That was me. <laughs> but I ran into the the attitude that i was used to giving skeptics they didn't believe me they were like right. no that wasn't you and and here's here's the classic quote i know what i saw and it wasn't yeah. you and so yeah. i even described it i was like you guys came out you had three cars right there were three cars that pulled up and they're like oh yeah and, and you walked across the field towards the woods yeah that was me. <laughs> I was in there. I, my wife was there with me. She's like, yeah, that was us. We were there. And still they were like, no, no, that couldn't have been you. We know what we saw. It just, you know, it came out of nowhere. And I was like, I came out of the woods. <laughs> That's where I came <laughs> from. So I really tried. And it, it makes me cringe because 
even if you hear it on the tour later, like when I when I said we went back and we heard it on tour, like I spoke to the tour guy and I explained it, but it's still they don't believe you because yeah. they want to believe in that story. Plus, what? you look like you look like that guy when you're like, oh, that was me. That was I try I I explain you know I can explain that it was me and they're like yeah sure sure buddy all right keep drinking walk away yeah uh, so yep. yeah I tried um actually that happened to me at Rolling Rolling Hills Asylum when um people said I kept catching this capturing this voice that says I'm cold and it's like that was me because it was <laughs> freezing but they didn't want to believe me either okay what's the most surprising solution you found to a paranormal claim outside of taking off the phantom's mask to discover that it's the dude that ran the water slide <laughs> oh wow um well that's a good question that i'm totally not prepared for um <laughs> there there's been there's been uh well actually the one the one case that i i worked on it was uh it was a famous case called whispers estate and i will condense this story because it's a long story but basically they had uh, for years, they had a reputation for people hearing a ghostly girl sing uh, lullabies and that you didn't need any recorders or equipment. You would hear it with your own ears. And it was like this weird, echoey sound. And after a few years of hearing it and, and making some arrangements, I was finally able to go. And during the course of the investigation, I crawled around in a crawl space underneath the, the main floor and I. I discovered speakers that were right underneath a vent that was open to the, to the uh, crawl space and they mm. were placed there. It wasn't like they were thrown. They were actually hidden behind the, uh, behind the uh, supporting uh, uh, columns. And then the wires were run to the basement um, basement area where there were stereo equipment. Uh, it wasn't plugged in because a new owner had taken over, but all of this stuff was there. And that for me, and again, this is a, a really extremely condensed version of the story. Basically, that's most likely what had happened there. And I was expecting more of hearing like maybe it was a neighbor, neighbor's kid that was singing or maybe a neighbor's stereo or something like that. I didn't actually expect speakers to be set up in the basement. And the way the house was set up, I mean, it was perfect. If you played anything, it would come through and it would have that echo effect. There were a lot of factors involved that created this echo voice. Um, so it was really fun. Um, I, I I wasn't allowed back <laughs> for several years. Um, I don't understand that. <laughs> I, I don't know, because maybe I wrote about it <laughs> and, and exposed it. But, you know, I mean, it, that's the new owners. There's new owners and they actually reached out to me uh, about a year ago and asked me to come back um, because they, they okay. think. There really is activity there and they want me to come back and, and check it out for reels this time. So, I mean, I'm all for it. You know, I'm, I'm playing around with the air quotes, but I'm all for it. I'd be happy to go back and, and listen to their claims. Awesome. Okay. From Bay Area Skeptics, what is a good way to relate to people who are trying to convince you that ghosts exist? What is a good way to relate to people? Talk to them. Just talk. Again, it goes back to the, the casual bar environment thing. I don't, I, I love having serious conversations. And the the reason I do the whole skeptical halt bar is because at conferences, whether it's paranormal or science, people are the most honest and most forthcoming when we're all at the bar hanging out and, and you know, had a drink or two. And it's a nice, nice casual environment. So I try to talk to them. I try to learn what they're thinking, why they're thinking it, where this, where this idea come from. And I put out little, uh, little, uh, like I'll tell them about my background and look, I was there too. I, I was right there and I, I thought this too, but then I, you know, I looked into the photography a little bit and I learned I was making a mistake. It was all me. And I'm not shy about that. I make sure they understand that I know I was responsible. I'm not trying to blame anyone else. And I think that opens them up a little bit. And especially when you ask them to explain, explain to me why you think this way. And it gives them an opportunity, opportunity to state their case. And it makes them feel better. It, it makes them a little at ease because now someone's not just, it, it, cause especially with me, 
I have when I walk into a conference, a paranormal conference, I'm already dubbed the token skeptic. So, you know, they already have this idea like, oh, he's not going to believe me. But when I do, when I'm asking, when I'm trying, like, hey, tell me your story, it opens them up and they're like, well, all right, let's talk about it. I'm going to I'm going to show you. And that's usually the mentality. The really strong. I'm going to show you what this is. And then by the end of the conversation, there is some doubt. There's the seed of doubt that's been planted. And that's usually the way it goes. And 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 just being nice. You know, I, I call it the Patrick Swayze rule. Be nice until it's time to not be nice. And that usually yeah. I try to push that off. Um, but be as nice as you can. And well, and we're you already fighting, it. we're already fighting an uphill battle battle yeah. with, with skepticism and trying to fight all the misinformation. The yeah. the least we can do is be polite along the way. Because that'll open more doors than being confrontational. Absolutely, and like I said, you you don't preach to people. You just have a friendly conversation, and and that works great. When when I um, set up my booth at at paranormal conferences, I have a the skeptical help booth. You saw it in the pictures. It looks like Lucy's uh, booth from Peanuts. I don't actively go out and and bother the other vendors. I let them come yeah. to me. So, I mean, it, that makes them feel more at ease, too, because it makes them feel like more in control. Yeah. Awesome. What's the best evidence that you've seen for ghosts outside of being mistaken for one? <laughs> best evidence you've seen for ghosts? Nothing. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have not seen anything that was that I would consider evidence of ghosts. Uh, it, it's there's so I, I guess. I don't know if it's a uh, more of a filtered view now because I do know so much about photography and video editing that I look at photos now or, or clips and I immediately pick out like, oh, I recognize that. I recognize that. So it's very difficult to to look at. I mean, I still do. I look at each case, even though if it's the same picture or same video over and over again, I'll, I'll look at it. I'll take a look and listen to their story. But as far as best evidence, there, there, there hasn't been. It's uh, honestly, and I'm not trying to be mean, but it's crap. It is really crap. Uh, be, most because, mostly because you're dealing with, and I'm not saying this as an insult, but you're dealing with amateurs, mm -hmm. amateurs that that are picture takers. They're not photographers. They're picture takers, and they are not uh, the filmmakers. They are people with a video camera, and they're more like tourists. So again, it's not an insult. That's just what it is, plain and simple. They don't understand what they're capturing or how they're capturing it. They're not paying attention when they capture something because they usually, in the ghost hunting community and every general, in general, all the, the fringe topics, they take pictures and video and they wait for days before they review it. So now mm -hmm. they don't even remember the details. So there's a lot that goes wrong with that. So to answer your question, the short answer, because I, I drew it out really long here, is I haven't seen anything that was really good. Do you regret sinking a bunch of money into worthless ghost hunting equipment over the years? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because it was a lot of money. I mean, yeah. hundreds, thousands. Yeah, there's a lot of money that was that was into it. But on the positive side, I, I literally took something that was a negative and changed it into a positive because now. I've written articles and done videos where I take the stuff apart and show you exactly what's inside. Um, like for instance, I mean, this is actually a great, we got time. This is a ghost hunting tool that somebody gave me. It's supposed to be an EM pump because for some, uh, there's an idea that ghosts love EMF, that that's how they power thing. It's let them, it gives them energy to do stuff. So this, I forget how much this sells for, I think we're talking like $150, $200. And I just opened it up <laughs> as, as the video was playing. I was able to look at, open it up. And all it is is two magnets that are hot glued inside on two solenoids that when you turn it on, I'm going to make sure it doesn't mess up the, the camera feed here. But when you turn it on, it just spins. That's all it does. And, and people pay this probably cost them like five dollars to build and that's one of the things that i do like i show people now this is what's inside this is what it actually does or what it doesn't do 
the tech ghost and like <laughs> advise them don't spend your money on this don't waste hundreds of dollars because if i mean if you really want it you can build this you can build this yourself maybe in an hour or two with five six dollars worth of uh uh equipment yeah so you turned them into teaching tools, yes which is teaching great. moments yeah well we're gonna have to wrap up kenny and i just want to say again thank you so much for being part of skeptical um it's been a blast i, I love listening to your story and uh yeah let thank me you say, so much i love that shirt thank you so much for wearing it thank you guys thank you for everyone that you guys invited me and everyone that watched it, I hope you enjoyed it. I really hope you got something out of it. And I'm available for questions. I mean, tonight I'm doing a show after this show, but, you know, reach out to me. Uh, I, I answer pretty much every email I get, unless they're yes. really weird. Then I ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Kenny. It was great seeing you.